Hi, I'm Andy, and this is a video about how I wrote a snake game using Terraform, which is probably, uh, which is definitely a terrible idea, uh, definitely the worst uh, idea, worst language for writing snake in that I've used so far. Um, hopefully, there'll be a little bit uh, we can learn about Terraform on the way. I definitely learn uh, quite a bit about what's actually happening in Terraform, what it is. Um, okay, so we'll start off by talking about what, uh, why Snake and what Snake is. Um, we'll talk about Terraform, then I'll moan a little bit about uh, some things in Terraform. Then I'll show you how I cheated to make this work. Then I'll show you some code I quite like. Then I'll show you some code I absolutely hate and I'm deeply ashamed of. A couple of thoughts about Terraform and we'll be done. Okay, so first of all, why why write Snake in a, in a thing like Terraform? Why write Snake at all? Well, uh, mainly because it's Snake and I like Snake. Uh, it's an easy program to write. It's easy. It's a fun game to play, um, but it does require um, some basic programming stuff like arrays and loops, uh, and it requires user interface, which is um, always a challenge for um, actually figuring out how a language is really put together or how easy it is to get stuff working. Uh, UI is particularly challenging in this case, but we'll get to that. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about what Terraform is. So Terraform is a language that is used to describe um, infrastructure, um, like what stuff you want, like computers or whatever, um, especially in cloud services. Um, it was created uh, quite recently compared with a lot of programming languages, so um, was able to learn from the mistakes that ma made in other similar languages. So yeah, it describes uh, what stuff you want uh, to be running in your cloud environment or somewhere else, uh, for example, computers or virtual machines. Uh, databases or other kind of services provided by the cloud provider, uh, what networking setup, security stuff, permissions, all that. Um, so you just describe what you want and Terraform will make it so. And it's kind of um, a declarative language. So don't, you don't give it actions like make this computer and name it this. You just say, I, I wish for this computer with this name to exist. Um, and Terraform will just make it, make sure that that is the case. So that's the idea anyway. Um, okay, so um, here's a little bit of um, waffling about what um, Terraform code looks like. So these 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 are some words that you're going to see when you write Terraform code. So, for example, uh, in the top uh, in the left there, variable um, is the word you use in Terraform code to describe some input variables that are going to go into your code. Uh, data uh, is the word you use to describe some data source that you're going to read in order to understand what's going on. And then within your Terraform code, you're going to have these things called locals, um, which are essentially, they're like, like local variables, except they're not, they don't vary. You can, they can only have one value. Um, and you can have modules, which are basically a way of reusing Terraform code or packaging it up into smaller chunks. Uh, then you, you write output to, to describe what output gets printed out by your Terraform code. And you write resource to describe the resources that you want to get created in your cloud environment. So the actual things. So this is, these are the words that you use when you write Terraform code. And the, and the flow is approximately like how I've drawn it. So, um, data and input variables kind of come in. And then your, your code itself, including the resource descriptions, describe what stuff you want to happen. Uh, then when you run it, it does the stuff with the resources. And then also as a side effect, uh, it prints out some output. Um, so uh, what's really going on though is slightly different. So I've got that all that stuff I had on the previous slide up in the top left, except for the stuff to do with resources and state. So what actually happens when you run your Terraform code um, is it takes the input um, and data sources you know, and your description of resources and it, it, it uses all that to come up with its kind of desired state of like, what should the world look like um, after I've finished? And then it also takes what it knows or thinks is the previous state of the real world. And it stores that in this file called terraform.tf state. And then it does a diff. It compares the two of those and, and sees whether they're the same. And if they're not the same, it does whatever work is needed to make the actual world look like our desired state. So that's what happens when you run Terraform apply. It like figures out what you meant, figures out what you had before, makes any changes so that it, it really looks like what you meant. Um, and of course that, that brings us the possibility that the state might be out of date. 
Um, so there is this terraform refresh command, which brings your the previous state that you have got stored in that terraform.tf state file up to date by looking at the real world. So in general, that terraform.tf state file won't be in your source control and all the rest will. Okay, so let me start by moaning a little bit about the experience of writing code in Terraform. Maybe I'm coming at it the wrong way, but we'll see. Okay, so uh, let's start with um, defining locals. So locals are like local variables, although as I said, they're not actually variables, they don't vary. Um, but yeah, so to define locals, you make a, a locals block and you put stuff inside there. And then to use a local later in your code, you know, to say, give me the value of this thing in some other expression that you're writing, you write local dot and then the name that you gave that local. Fair enough. So how about resources? Would we define then resources in a resources block? What do you think? Well, no, you define resources separately with each block being called resource. Not too bad so far. How about if you want to use the resource? Perhaps you'd use it with resource dot name. Similar to how we use locals. What do you think? Nope. Uh, or perhaps we'd use it with resource dot type dot name because each resource has a type. What do you think? Nope. You use it with type dot name. So you namespace, you got this namespace for local, um, but then the types are their own namespace. Uh, okay, fair enough. Um, how about um, the inputs to this process? Would we define those with input, maybe? Uh, what do you think? Nope. You define inputs with the keyword variable. And actually, um, because that's quite confusing, you'll find a lot of people who talk about Terraform call them input variables to try and help us remember that when, it's, when we say variable, we actually mean input. And let me slightly digress about this. The reason why this kind of makes sense within the world of Terraform is, um, uh, in a sense, nothing inside a Terraform program varies. So if you run the same program again, um, you should get exactly the same results next time, and nothing will vary, uh, even if, it, even if, well, no, yeah. So, um, so, so everything is kind of completely um, declarative nothing varies. The only thing that varies is the stuff coming in from the outside world. So that's why inputs are called variables because they're, the, they're a thing that can vary or oh, something. Anyway, point is just call them input variables and hopefully you'll remember that the keyword you have to use is variable. Okay, so if we're going to use a variable, um, perhaps we use it with variable dot name. What do you think? Nope, use it with var dot name. Presumably variable was um, short enough to use for the block, but then too long to use in expressions. So now we've got two words. Um, how about outputs? How do we, maybe perhaps we define all our outputs with a, with each output with a block called output. What do you think? Yes, we do. Okay, we're getting somewhere. How about we define each data source? Perhaps we define it with a block called data. What do you think? Yes, we're getting somewhere. We're starting to understand. So, of course, we would define each module with the keyword module, right? What do you think? Nope. We define a module by creating a directory. This is probably the most confusing part for me when I was getting used to this. So you create a directory similar to something like Python. Um, put some code inside there. That's a module. Fair enough. Uh, how what might we then use a module? So like use the code that's inside that directory. Well, we we do that by adding a module block. So this is the part that confused me. So I, I couldn't understand why a module block, what a module block was. Well, a module block is just using some code in a module, not defining it. Uh, so perhaps we'll use an output from a module by saying module dot module name dot output name. What do you think? Yes, you do. So if you've got, um, if you've written some code in a module and it has some outputs defined, uh, then in some other code that's using that module, you can have an expression, a module dot module name dot output name, and you get the value of that expression. Okay, so Terraform was written relatively recently, so we were able to learn from other people's mistakes, right? But somehow didn't, and the names are just all over the place. Anyway, enough moaning. So let's get on to how I cheated in order to actually get Snake 
to run in Python. So, uh, in Terraform. So, uh, I've given it away. So I wrote a bit of Python, uh, that wraps around my Terraform code. And actually now seems like a good time to show you it running to prove that this, this program really does work. So I'm going to switch to my terminal. I'm going to run my Terraform program. So this is a little bit of Python 3 wrapped around some Terraform, and I'll show you exactly how that works in a minute. Now you'll notice it takes just a little while to get up and running. Now I'm going to press the right arrow key, and if we're patient, we'll see that after a while, the snake will start moving to the right. You can see uh, uh, in the terminal window, it's registered that I pressed the right arrow, by, and it's showing as a little R letter. Um, and if we're very patient, this is quite a fast modern computer. Um, um, we have to be really on our toes to um, make sure we're controlling our snake in the correct way. And press down now, and then we wait. So yeah, you can see that this Terraform code is doing an enormous amount of extremely clever things in order to use the full CPU of my relatively modern computer to calculate uh, how to play Snake. So we're eating the apple, the apple moves somewhere else, so you can see the game works. And look, the snake is getting longer. Okay, I think we're going to leave it there. Oh uh, yeah, so this is how I cheated. Um, there's a little bit of code written in Python 3 uses Pygame to draw the window, stuff like that. And what it does is it, it listens for input, the arrow keys that I was pressing, and every time it gets some input, it, it adds, it appends that uh, a letter to the um, an array, which is a list of like all the input we've received so far. So if it gets no key presses in a time step, it just appends a dot to that array, or sorry, a string. And um, if you press a key, it appends like R or U for like, they pressed up or they pressed right. Um, and then once it's got it, it runs Terraform. It actually runs Terraform twice each time step. First it runs Terraform Apply, and it passes in that input. So that's the bit that tells Terraform to actually do its work. And then it runs Terraform Output uh, to say, give me back the result of the work that you've done. And then you saw in the, in the terminal window, the text that got printed out, which was like a textual representation of a snake game. Um, so the Pi game code then or the Python code, then reads in that um, textual description and turns it into the graphical display that you saw. So that's how the game works. That's that's the extent to which I cheated. So we pass in the full input, everything that's happened up till now, to Terraform every time. Um, so it, it, the way that looks is that every time, every time step, we run Terraform apply again. And as I was saying, each time um, the input that we're passing in gets a bit longer because another time step has passed. So we're passing in everything that, that happened to Terraform, and Terraform figures out the current state of the game from that. Okay, so let's have a look at some actual Terraform code, and I can start to try and describe how I achieved this uh, remarkable achievement of calculating the enormous amount of uh, clever stuff that needs to be done to play Snake. So it, um, let's first look at some of the bits of snake.tf, which is our kind of main file. So Terraform... Uh, programs don't have like a main method or anything like that. They just, but the, the file that we start off, the file that we run is snake.tf and it, in a way it's a kind of a main method in that the outputs that are defined in here get printed out here. But yeah, when you run Terraform, it runs everything in this directory, um, and uh, updates all the resources in the way that you asked it to and prints out any outputs that it finds. Anyway. Snake.tf is where we're starting. So we have, we've defined an input variable, which I called imp, and its type is string. So that's basically something I can pass in on the command line. And we define an output, which I'm just calling text here. Uh, and we say what its value is. And its value gets got from a module called view. So module.view.text means go and uh, look at the module called view get me the output called text from there, and then that's my value, which we then print out on the console. So that's how that um, grid got printed out on the console. Um, uh, yeah, so now another part of the snake um, that, that I should explain is something very important, of course, to, to playing snake. Goodness me, I keep pressing the wrong key. Um, and another uh, part of what's 
another thing that's important in uh, writing a snake game is you need some random numbers. So in snake.tf, we also have uh, a resource defined using um, a resource provider that's part of uh, Terraform. It's on the Terraform website called Random Integer. So when you put this code into Terraform and run Terraform in it, it goes and downloads the, the module that it needs that's called Random Integer. And then our name for this particular random integer that we're generating is Apple. And actually, um, I said that wrong because it's actually two random integers we're generating. That, and the way we can see that is because that count thing that towards the bottom is set to two. So basically we're saying make two copies of this resource. Um, that's what count is. And then the stuff above count, those are kind of inputs to the module. So I find this pretty weird um, in Terraform that in, in your resource block, you're using things for two different purposes here. So max, min and max are inputs that are needed by the random integer module. And then count is like some special property that is used by resource itself to say, oh, you're going to have two lots of this. Anyway, point is, this, this code generates two random integers uh, and puts them in, in the name Apple. And we'll see how you get them out in a bit. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so a little bit more code from snake.tf. Here are some locals. Uh, I've actually shown, I'm only showing you one here. It's called initial model. And you can see that these locals can have, which are kind of variables or, you know, named values. Um, they can have complex structure like this. So we've got, we've got this local called initial model and it has a size, which, uh, you get the, um, we're using the, another, we're using an input variable called size, which I didn't actually show you, which is just like the size of the grid. Um, to make size, but then also there's a snake, which is an array of arrays, and the, the arrays inside it are the coordinates of the positions of the snake. Um, we've got another array called apple, which is the position of the apple, and here you can see where we're using that random integer uh, resource that I showed you on the previous slide. So here we're saying, get me the first thing in apple, so apple bracket zero, and get me the result, because that's just the name of the output in that module, random integer. Um, so anyway, this is just, that's the way you say, give me the first random number, give me the second random number. Um, so the position of the apple at the very beginning um, is going to be those two random numbers. The snake at the very beginning is going to be that array. The direction of the snake at the beginning is going to be upwards, and it's not dead. That's what dead equals false means. So this is our initial setup at the beginning of time before we've processed any of that input. Uh, other things inside snake.tf. Well, there's an update module. So here we're not defining the update module. Remember, we're using the update module. So we say module, and then we say the name that we want to give to the, this kind of call Call of this. We call It's like we're calling a function, and the name that we, we're giving this call is update. Um, and then the code that we're going to use is dot slash module slash update. So that's just the, the directory path of that, the code of the update module. Um, and then we're, we're providing it with some input here. So we're providing it with an input called model and an input called imp. So um, imp is that thing that got passed in on the command line. So we use var.imp to just refer to it. Um, and then the model, this this at this point, is from that local variable that we just saw defined on the previous slide. So we're passing in initial model um, that we saw on the previous slide as an input to the update module. And the name of that input is model. Okay, and then we're going to use another module as well. So this is the one we've already seen referred to before. So we referred to the, the answer from, from calling this module before. So let me show you where. So when we, in that output section, when we say module.view.text, we're saying, go and look at the, the, the module that I, the module call, whatever invocation that I called view and then get the output out of it called text, and that will be our value. So here's where we actually call that module. We say, okay, there's a there's some code at dot slash module slash view that I want you to use. The input that I want you to provide is uh, module dot update dot value. Um, or, or, you know, and the name of that input is model here. And then later we're gonna use it by saying module dot view dot text. Now you can't see here that the output of that view module is called text, which can be maybe a bit confusing. Um, we're just concerned with the kind of inputs that we're passing to at this point. Um, so yeah, notice that the model that we pass into view is the output from the update module that I just showed you a minute ago we were calling. 
So we're basically saying take the initial model, pass it to update, and then take the answer from that and pass it to view. So basically the steps are give me a model, uh, change it in some way, which is what update does you know, to make it look how it looks now, and then pass that model into the view, and the view module is the thing that actually prints out the textual representation of the snake game. So let's have a little bit of a closer look at what view looks like. So here is the kind of um, most important core part of the code for view. So basically this is, we're in a locals block here, but I've missed that bit out. This is defining a local called grid, which is going to become the, out, the text output later. Um, and it's basically one huge expression. We're just defining one thing called grid, but grid is going to be an array of arrays. And the way that you like do something a bit like loops in Terraform is you have these expressions, um, continuation expressions, I think they're called, like for x in local.x's and for for y in local.y. So those local.x's, local.y's, they're other variables, uh, other locals that I've defined. They're just a list of all the possible x coordinates, all the possible y coordinates. So we're basically saying loop through all the x's and y's in the whole uh, game, and then for each x, y com combination, process this expression inside. So, so the first thing that we do is check whether the snake is dead and we're on the first character of the snake. So that's, that's to, um, to make a nice, um, blue dot to say, uh, the, the head, uh, that we only draw on the head of the snake to say, oh, you're dead. So when you crash, um, your head goes blue. So that's the, the code for that is, um, if I'm dead, and my x, y coordinate is the first x, y coordinate in the snake, then the answer is D. So let me highlight some things here. So this question mark is essentially the if, so that would be familiar from something like C or Java, um, other languages that have this kind of expression form of an if then statement. So we're basically saying if all of this, then the answer is D, which means like a, a dead head, which comes up in blue on the, in the UI. And then this colon means else. So that's our first bit of expression. Then we've got another chunk here, another chunk here. So let's go right to the end and say, um, if it, um, we've got two choices, two outputs here from this expression. So this expression asks something, and then the, out, the output is either an O, which is like the body of the snake, or a space to say um, there's nothing in this grid square. So remember, we're looping through all the X's and Y's um, in the whole um, the whole world of the game. So is this so th what this part is saying is if this x y position is in the snake array. So contains says basically if this array var dot model dot snake contains this x y coordinate. Well then we're we're on the snake at the moment. So we'll, we'll our our output will be a sort of o symbol to look like a snake. Otherwise we've finished checking all the things it could be and it's just going to be a space. So that's, is the snake's, is the, are we on the snake's body? This is, are we on the apple, which you could probably see basically is the X coordinate, that first um, position of the apple, is the Y coordinate, that second position of the apple? If so, our answer is A. And then the previous bit is actually just, if we're on the edge of the screen, that's all that's saying, then the output is hash. So as you can see, this is not too bad, right? The, um, we've got a model, which is our, our snake, which look, look, or our whole snake game, in fact, which looks a bit like that initial model. And the first time we run this, it will actually be that initial model that we passed in. Um, and we're using, we're just taking that model and turning it into an array of arrays of letters, which describe our game state. So that's what the view module does. It's not that bad. Um, and then, Inside update, and we'll get to what update looks like in a minute, but inside update, we have, the, uh, we call another module called update one. What update one does is moves us forward one time step. So I'm going to give you a little bit of, uh, uh, how update one works. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. So there's code in there for move the snake forward one square and, uh, and stuff like that. So I'm just going to show you one bit that we do in there, which is check whether we've died. So we've moved forward or we're about to move forward one square. In fact, we've made a variable, made a local called new head, which is the new position of our snake, but we haven't yet moved our snake. So when is a snake dead in a snake game? Well, there's two possibilities. Either we've hit our own body or we've hit the edge. So let's think about hitting the edge first. 
So our, our new head, if our new head coordinate, the x coordinate is less than one, or the y coordinate is less than one, or the x coordinate is too big, or the y coordinate is too big, that means we've hit the edge of the screen. So dead is this expression of either you were already dead, in which case we just stop, or, or which again is a um, the way of writing or in languages like C and Java. Um, so either you were already dead or this whole blob, and then this whole blob is a bunch of things that are also all together. So first of all, either you've hit the hit the edge, or you've hit your own body. So again, we, we're using the contains function, which is included with Terraform, which says, does this array, the snake position, contain this new position, new head? If it does, that means we've hit our own body. Now, actually, there's a slight caveat here. All the snake games I've written up to this point work exactly the same way, as far as I know. Uh, this game is, has got a subtle bug in it, which is actually you can hit your own tail when you should, when your tail should have already moved out of your way. And that's because I'm comparing against the whole of this snake uh, array when actually I should ignore the last position in the array. So I could do that. Probably should have done that. Didn't do that. Um, so there's there's a bug for you in our version of snake. But anyway, you get the point. Am I dead? Well. If I'm already dead, then yes. Um, otherwise, if I've hit my own body or I've hit the edge, then I'm dead. And you, uh, you saw in the previous uh, slide that this the, the answer of, as to whether I'm dead gets used in that view um, module to say the color of your head, but also it stops you from moving anymore. Okay, so that was the good code or the okayish code. Uh, and now I'm gonna show you the update module, which is where I almost gave up and thought this is impossible. Why have I tried to write Snake in Terraform? And I eventually found this way of doing it for which I am very, very sorry. So what I didn't tell you is that you can play Snake um, if you have a lot of patience um, using this code, but uh, only for 50 time steps. And the reason why is because I only copied and pasted this code uh, 50 times. Um, and if I, I actually started out doing it 100 times and... Um, it was so slow and painful that I couldn't bring myself to leave it like that. So anyway, this is um, this is update.tf. So this is the module that gets called from within snake.tf. So it's the main bit to say, here's your initial model. Now update it using this input. And then it calls the view module to say, display it. Um, so what it actually does is it calls a, calls a module called update1, which we've already seen a bit of, um, multiple times. So first of all, giving it the name u underscore zero zero zero, it calls update one and it provides this input. So it says, your model is the model that got given to me. This var dot model is my input variable for this module. So, the, so pass in the model that was given to me and the input that was given to me and an index to say which bit of input are you interested in. And then call update one again. Um, and this time call the answer u underscore zero zero one and your input for that time is not not the model that I was given but the answer from the call to u underscore zero 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 that I've just defined above so essentially do this code and the output of that called value get the output of that pass it in as the input here again pass in the imp that we, we had before but this time the index as in the, the the part of input that we're interested in is one so I could have kind of pulled this stuff out and passed in just the letter um, but this seemed an easy enough way to do it so yeah just paste that code 50 times to say um, call two based on the answer from one call three based on the answer from two and so on and so on and so on until you get to 50. So the reason that I had to do this is because I can't find a way in Terraform of doing some kind of loop or repeated operation, but making you know the third one dependent on the value of the second one, and the fourth one dependent on the value of the third one, something like that. So you saw in the view module, we can do a kind of looping thing where we process um, all the elements of an array and do something to them. But we, can, as far as I can tell, you can't make the previous, the next one depend on the previous one. And there's another way of kind of looping in Terraform, which is to use this count um, thing, which says, how many copies of a, of a resource you want. But again, I can't seem to say, um, like make the fourth resource depend on the third resource. So when I uh, did this talk at work, a couple of people had some suggestions of how to make this a little bit better. One person suggested 
that instead of copying and pasting this code manually, I could generate this code by writing some Terraform and print it out that way, which would be a fun thing to attempt. Uh, and the other suggestion which I think would work is our Terraform could could create, have a resource in it, which is a file. It could write some stuff into that file. And then that file could be used as input next time around or as a data source next time around we run Terraform. So we could repeatedly run Terraform uh, right into a file and then using that file as input or a data uh, resource um, for the next run. And that way we would be able to maybe go on more than 50 times so it go on as long as we wanted. I imagine the slowness we've seen so far would be eclipsed by the slowness of that, but we'd have to see. Anyway, so that's how I made it work. Really interested in your comments. Um, please do comment below suggesting ways I could have done this without copying and pasting the code 50 times. But frankly, when I figured out I could do it this way, I was so pleased with myself that I thought I'll just leave it there. Okay, so some thoughts about Terraform. Uh, good things about it, well, you can use the same tool across multiple cloud environments and I think possibly other environments like your own data centers if you've got the right tooling. At least in principle you could, but certainly in practice you can use that, the same tool as in Terraform um, to define resources in multiple cloud environments. And it has this item potency thing, so when you when you run it twice, um, uh, it does, nothing changes, you get the same thing, and that's a cool thing to have for defining resources. Uh, downsides, actually that kind of same tool across all the different environments is a, a limited benefit because the actual resources that you're defining are different for each cloud environment, for each cloud provider. So um, you're going to be writing different code, but you are going to be running the same tool. So that could really help with like automation, setting up continuous integration and stuff like that. However, um, the tool that you're using has this weird inconsistent syntax. And, I, and, you know, some of the things that I described earlier, a part of that, you know, like, is it, what's a local, what's a variable, um, how do you access, how do you refer to things like that? Um, also, this thing that like count is like a special name that you can't use as an Im a module input because it's already getting used. No, you can't use as a resource descriptor because it's already getting used to say I want multiple resources and they're all just written next to each other and it's a bit weird. Um, yeah, and of course, that the the fact that the, ex the you can write expressions, um, but they get pretty complicated and you can't really break them up into separate modules very easily because actually calling a module is very awkward as well. Um, so that it, if you're writing complex expressions, it can get pretty um, convoluted as you saw. Um, uh, also, by the way, uh, think yourself lucky that you're using Terraform greater than or equal to 0 0.12 because before that expressions were really nothing like as flexible as they as I've showed. Um, there, are, there were ways of getting it to calculate expressions, but boy, were they weird. Um, but yeah, it does often make you feel like, can't I use an actual programming language for this instead of this uh, weird pretending not to be, but because people have shown that you need stuff that's gradually grown features that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it, once you understand what's actually going on, which hopefully this um, video has helped with, um, it does mostly work. So that's it. We managed to write Snake in Terraform. Uh, as I say, interest in your comments. Um, the, here's some links to the slides for this um, presentation and the code um, for lots of different snake games. Um, so look for the um, snake-terraform directory inside those two repos to find the stuff for this video. Um, more about me, um, you can watch more videos on my Peertube account on Diet Zone um, or on YouTube. Uh, you can find me on Mastodon and sometimes on Twitter. Um, you can find my website on artificialworlds.net and um, a code that I'm working on tends to be in uh, GitLab these days. Um, thank you very much. See you next time.